Yesterday was the first annual Jane Addams Day in the state of Illinois. A good time, we thought, to look back at the life and legacy of the Chicago woman who forever changed the way the country deals with the poor. In fact, the Chicago City Council named her the greatest woman who ever lived. Here's a portion of a WTTW program about Jane Addams. It was produced a few years ago, and the host is actress Ellen Burstyn. On September 18, 1889, the city of Chicago became the setting for a great human experiment. It would develop into one of the most important movements for social justice in the world. On that date, a young woman from Cedarville, Illinois, of the class where one was called a lady, did what no Midwestern lady had ever done before. She rented a dilapidated old house in the heart of a notorious Chicago slum. Her intention was to settle among the poor, to share their existence, so that together they might improve the dreadful conditions of the neighborhood, as well as exchange ideas and cultures. It was a daring scheme. Jane Addams seemed to forecast her own destiny, but it would take her eight years after she graduated from college to find her fate. She was valedictorian of her class at the Rockford Female Seminary in Illinois. In the 19th century, upper middle class women had two choices, to marry or not to marry. A career outside of teaching school or missionary work was not possible when one was also a wife. Jane chose a career. Jane read and studied and submerged herself in her family's social life, but her aimlessness saddened her. Finally, a second trip to Europe gave her a direction. In London's East End, she witnessed industrial poverty and human misery firsthand. She also visited Toynbee Hall and was most impressed by this university settlement. It was run by Oxford men who lived among the poor and identified with their struggles. By the time she returned home, she had a plan. It was a simple plan, but the course of social welfare in America would never be the same. And so on one autumn day in 1889, Hull House, originally located between a saloon and an undertaking parlor, or as one wag put it, Twix Death and the Devil opened its doors. What kind of city was Chicago 100 years ago? A prominent journalist of the time described it as first in violence, deepest in dirt, loud, lawless, unlovely, ill-smelling, new, an overgrown gawk of a village, the teeming tough among cities. 100 years ago, women were just beginning to initiate ideas and actions under their own authority. Some were shocked at this unwomanly behavior. What's more, these people couldn't understand why well-brought-up young ladies would choose to live with poor people. Why couldn't they just visit and then go home to their nice neighborhoods, the way other charity workers did? About this time, in the 1890s, the Chicago Tribune listed more than 200 men whose fortunes were over one million. A man like Marshall Field could spend $75,000 on a birthday party for his son while the sons and daughters of immigrants might earn from 40 cents to four dollars a week in the sweatshops. The sweating system began with the large manufacturing companies. They paid contractors called sweaters to finish work started in the factories. The sweaters hired the cheapest non-union labor. That meant mostly immigrant women and children to do piecework in their homes. The contractors were paid for the number of finished products so he sweated as much work out of his employees as possible, working them 10 to 15 hours a day. Living in the community gave the Hull House residents first-hand experience of labor unions. Labor was building up strength in all the major industrial areas like Massachusetts and New York. But the majority of unions were organized in Chicago. Several were founded at Hull House and sometimes strikers met at the settlement while the strike lasted. The Factory and Workshop Inspection Act. Its passage was due to the efforts of labor unions, the Hull House Group, Governor Altgeld, and other reformers. The law was revolutionary enough for some industry leaders to suggest that Jane Addams should be hanged from the nearest lamppost. The act prohibited the employment of children under 14 
and fixed an eight-hour day for older children and women. Her pacifist views didn't win her many friends during the war years. In fact, the Daughters of the American Revolution expelled her. In response, Jane Addams said that she thought she was a life member, but discovered it was only during good behavior. Jane got the last word, though. She was the first American woman to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. People in time will develop a tolerance which will make war impossible. And the old dream for universal peace will come about because the people will no longer tolerate anything else. The influence of Hull House reached across the United States. A group of talented amateurs had become effective professionals and made the house a model for all settlements. In a few years, the women of Hull House had achieved more in the area of social reform than any other group of American women before or since. Jane Addams and her five associates enjoyed very long lives, but they never lost their youthful enthusiasm for new challenges. In addition to being Jane Addams Day, yesterday was also the 75th anniversary of the day Jane Addams won the Nobel Peace Prize. For people with developmental disabilities, finding work can be one of the toughest challenges. And when there is work, it's often no more demanding or satisfying than 